Construction Champions, it's your host, Ron Newsbaum, and we're here for another amazing episode of Construction Champions Podcast, where we're burning the damn house down. Mondays and Thursdays, you can find us. Like I said before, you're probably not tuning in to see me. You're here for our amazing guests, which I'm here for too. And as always, I'm super excited for our conversation today. Michelle, it is great to have you here. Thanks, Ron. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Why don't you take a few minutes or however long you need to tell the construction champions out there a little bit about you and what got you here to today? Yeah, so um, I started a law firm about 20 years ago um, with a vision of providing businesses with access to legal. Um, most smaller companies avoid it, minimize it. I, the number of times I've heard, you know, hey, I'm so if I if I never have to call you, I'll be happy. Um, and really, the the opposite is true. And so Equinox Business Law Group, we've actually rebranded a couple of times, but Equinox is really about giving businesses access to a general counsel the way that larger companies have a general counsel who oversees and quarterbacks their risk mitigation and their kind of forward thinking strategic vision. The way most small businesses work with legal, though, is, is as a siloed, I have a guy who does my employment and I have a guy who does my um, IP and maybe a gal who does my contracts um, because that's how they've been taught to use legal. But there's no quarterback. And what we need to be strategic is quarterback. So over the years, we've you know navigated like what are the what are the challenges that most small businesses run into? What are the key things that um, help them to grow strategically and forward thinking and proactively and build a solution that is an outsourced general counsel? So it's a fixed fee, all inclusive to help businesses and their teams to leverage legal on a regular ongoing basis in a relationship. Um, a lot of folks use outsource CFO, outsource CMO, outsourced HR. We do that for legal. It's just really not as commonly found, but it's magical once folks have it. Awesome. Yeah, it's not not very commonly found, but I can definitely see where you're coming from and how how practical something like that is. So I'm like I said, I'm super excited for our conversation today. And I'm just gonna dive right in there and ask you the million dollar question. And that is, what makes a construction champion? I think what makes a construction champion from a professional services standpoint, because I'm going to come at it from that angle, and that is really an understanding of like what it is about construction that is challenging and what are the opportunities for these kinds of companies to be stronger, more secure in the marketplace, able to withstand the storm when the storm inevitably hits, as we know. Um, and so the way that I look at it is understanding that, you know, contracts are a huge part of being in this business. Supply chain is a huge part of being in this business. Um, access to employees and then managing employees through this process. You've got unions in a lot of cases as well. There's all of these components that are, um, while they're, they're applicable to all businesses, construction has its unique space. And so understanding that and the ability to really connect with folks in the construction industry across across all different sort of elements of it, all different sort of practice areas of it, and understand how those fit together, how the subs fit together, how the, the GCs fit together with the customers, and really engage at a strategic, how do we build this company to withstand the storm? And that to me is, is kind of the magic. I love it because the storm's coming. Everybody <laughs> out there knows it's eventually coming. So, and from this perspective, being that you guys do law is we're going to, I have some over the questions would be, I, I love where you're going with that and where the storm's coming. How aren't guys prepared for the storm that you see from a legal perspective? Yeah. And I'm going to caveat that because a lot of this, the storm is the opportunity as well. It's not just the, the disaster. So, you know, there's so much to look forward to and so much to build on, but being aware of what, those possible left turns are those things that are going to happen in your business, no matter what, and being prepared for them is more of the storm piece. Um, what we're seeing right now is a huge um, emphasis on transparency in regulations. And so 
We are seeing it in the Corporate Transparency Act, which some of you may have heard of. Um, the employment rules kind of across the country from non-competes to NDAs um, to, you know, uh, pay equity. There are all these areas where regulation is forcing businesses to be more open and transparent with what they're doing. Um, and at the same time, get, taking away tools that we've used in the past to protect ourselves. So a lot of folks have relied upon non-competes and non-solicitations and confidentiality provisions. And the regulations are starting to pull those back more toward workers' rights. And, and there's good and bad to that. You know, there, there's reasons why that's that's valuable. But as a business, we need to be thinking about not only, oh, I need to yank that provision out of my employment contract, but also what am I replacing it with? So now I have a gap in my tool set. I used to have a non-compete and now I don't have that. What do I do instead? Because otherwise I've got this gaping hole from what I have been accustomed to having. So figuring out how to think not only about what's now required, but what do we do instead is, is a piece of the proactive work that has to be done on an ongoing basis. Yeah, no, that makes so much sense because that's just like anything we do when something moves out of the process, you have to fill that in. But I think like with what you're talking about, when like there's government regulations and stuff or stuff changes and we remove stuff because of that, or we even add stuff in, I've been around when stuff has been added in, but the process still, it stays the same. We just added, like you move out, you go like, here's, here's another thing. But like you said, you create a whole that needs to be fixed. Like even though that what you had there is not allowed to be there anymore, you still have to make sure that you have that all your T's and I's crossed and dotted. And we don't have the tendency to do that. We just have the tendency to remove it and say, well, can't use that anymore. And, yep. and you're right just react, reacting. Anymore. Yeah, reacting to the situation, being like, okay, well, you know, too bad. We don't have it. You know, one of the things that we talk with with clients about are the the legal infrastructure tools that are available. And so, legal infrastructure. Um, you know, I have sort of three key things that I that I talk about. The first is contracts. Like, what do our contracts do for us? Right? They set the rules. They set the the um, expectations of the relationship, and they set the dispute resolution procedures. You know, allocation of risk, basically. But sometimes you have a dispute or a situation that falls outside of the contract, right? Um, maybe it's a fire, maybe it, it's it's an act by an employee. The, the contract isn't explicitly covering. So you're going to then look to your insurance. Your insurance is kind of your second line of defense. So do I have insurance that protects me here, that covers my risk? Um, and if insurance doesn't step in, we all have probably experienced situations where insurance is like, oh, that's not us. Um, <laughs> um, then you have your limited liability entity, typically a corporation or an LLC, that worst case scenario, you as the owners have some protection if the whole thing you know, blows up. So when we're thinking about something that's being removed from a contract, do we have another tool that we can sit step in instead? So maybe it's an insurance tool. Um, if we have employment liability, if we have um, a different kind of contract with, with that employee. So what are the kinds of things that we should be backfilling some of those issues with? Um, and, you know, again, that requires a proactive look at what are we trying to do here? And in a lot of cases, we're not really trying to stop someone from, you know, going to work for a competitor, but we want them not to steal our clients or our employees, right? So it's the non-solicitation we actually care about and the confidentiality. Can we beef those up instead as, as an example? Yeah. Well, for me on non-competes in the past, it was more about like IP. Like we had ways we did it that was different than everybody else. And that that was a selling point. And like that was one of the reasons to have the non-compete. Because the last thing you want somebody taking all your trade secrets over to the next competitor or starting up their own place and going head to head with you with this with what's your differentiator. Yep. And that's a great example because while you know, the argument is, well, that's under confidentiality, right? Obviously, I have to keep that stuff confidential, and I'm going to completely abide by my confidentiality provisions. But that's in your head, right? So I can't extract it from your head, and you're going to go work for my competitor. So you may not be explicitly using my confidential information, but you've learned this, right? This is a part of, like, who you are now. And so the non-compete kind of makes some sense in that, in that situation because you know stuff. Um, but we're seeing a trend, you know, across the country that, um, these are, these are going 
employer being significantly limited. Um, and again, you know, there's there's reasons why that makes some sense because they are probably overused, um, you know, across the board. But you know, should they still remain for some of these select, you know, trade secrets, you know, type type situations? Yeah, I think they're like either way underutilized or way overused. Like there's yeah. there's not really a happy medium. It's either people have them or they have like one that is you're not going to ever work in the entire half of this country for somebody that could something completely insane. Like yes. it, there's there's really not a happy medium when it comes to that. And that's probably why you're seeing federal regulations and stuff come into play. Yeah. And as as we see more globalized, you know, workforce and more remote workforce, you know, the idea of geographical limitations is is becoming more challenging, right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't have the geographical limitations the way we used to. Yeah, I mean, they got people running excavators from offices on job sites right. <laughs> halfway around the world. It's unbelievable. It's some crazy of the stuff that yeah. I'm seeing happen out there. Uh, but yeah, so, I mean, we're having a, a conversation about transparency. So I want to have a transparent conversation. I want to ask the question about why, why are we so reactive when it comes to lawyers and law instead of being proactive or what are the, what, cause I, I understand like everybody's like, well, I'll get a lawyer when I need to get a lawyer. When, when yeah. something goes completely south, that is when I would seek legal counsel. You know, I've learned through the years is like having a good law. It's worth, I acquired a business and I went and I got the best business attorney in the city I was in. And I, he wasn't cheap, but it was worth every penny of it in the lead up. Like I, I, immediately before I even made an offer was counseling with him to understand because I had never done that. But I think people get very re reactive in the situation instead of going and saying, hey, I could learn a lot that's going to save me a lot of money by doing that. So like, can you speak to some of that? I know that's a lot to unpack right there. Sometimes I can get wordy with my question. <laughs> you know, you, you hit the nail on the head though, because, you know, we've been taught to minimize legal, right? We minimize it as this expense that we only use it if we absolutely have to use it. So it becomes a firefighting tool, right? This is not a strategic tool, it's a firefighting tool. Um, and you know, the question is why? Well, the industry has really made it difficult to engage, especially for smaller companies, right? You're not important enough to rise to the top of the workload list. And so the responsiveness is typically low the cost is unknown in many cases. So it's not even that it's high, but you have this, you know, anxiety that it's going to be high. Um, and you're often not getting what you can actually use because it's not connected to the business. It's a legal document that is maybe not very understandable or maybe not even related directly to what you asked for because the com no one wants to pay for the strategic conversations it's too expensive to pay for the strategic conversations so it becomes super transactional and then it's minimize it and the number of times i've gotten a lease that's like can you just look it over and, and let me know if it's okay well it's you know if you've ever seen a lease they're 60 plus pages easily um and we can't just look it over right <laughs> that's not our job so what are we you know how do we bridge that and I think that the bridge is, you know, kind of what, what I've been trying to solve for the last, you know, 20 years. And that is how do we get this access that is not around, that is not functioning around cost and transaction, but rather a relationship with counsel? How do we get businesses access to the general counsel that large companies have that oversees and quarterbacks the legal relationship. Um, the idea of the siloed legal solution, which is, you know, you've got the employment guy and you've got the IP guy and you have the real estate guy. Um, the idea of that actually came from a response to larger companies, general counsel, and their need for something very specific and nuanced to support their general counsel team in house. Well, small businesses don't have that general counsel. And so instead, they're using all these siloed services that are completely disconnected and disjointed and they don't know how to quarterback it because that's not their role. That's not their job. 
So it gets expensive because there's a lot of redundancy. There's a lot of, you know, repeating conversations, getting, getting people up to speed. But if we can solve that with the relationship that you just talked about, right, by having someone who knows you, knows your industry, knows your business, knows your risk tolerance. And that's actually a really critical piece is that the way, Ron, that you would run your business and the way that somebody in a very similar business would run theirs could be very different based on the fact that your experiences are different and your risk tolerance is different. And so someone who understands how to approach your problems because they know you, they're going to be able to zero in on what's right for you more quickly. And so that solution is how the industry needs to operate differently. Yeah, no, I'm a firm believer in that, you know, relationships and building that is best for any business. Because if you understand the customer, you understand who you're dealing with, everything's going to end up being better. Uh, and I, I like where, where you're talking about, but I, I think some of that really just was like a, an amazing fact for me is so you how the legal system is based or is built is built for big corporations. Is, is that, did I hear that right? Like that's why it's so siloed is because they're, they're more designed to serve bigger corporations that, in, that already have a legal counsel. Yeah, so, the, so what's called big law, so these big firms that do a little bit of everything, were definitely formed around that concept. That's, that's where they came from. And then you have the smaller firms that do a little bit of everything or do only one thing. So you have a specialized, um, you know, employment practice or, you know, a specialized corporate practice. Um, so those guys sometimes will only do one piece of it, or they're more like us where you're a journalist and you do a little bit of everything. But their capacity is sometimes strained and and they're still lawyers. And so how do we balance this understanding of business? Because I think that's one of the gaps is understanding, you know, an entrepreneur is a risk taker, right? By nature, that's what we do, right? <laughs> we 100%. are pretty comfortable, pretty comfortable with risk. And so getting a lawyer who is taught to be completely risk averse to come to the table and understand that these decisions that we're making as entrepreneurs are emotional, they're financial, they're personal. It's not just a question of, of risk or what's kind of the best thing to do because the best thing to do has so many facets as an owner and an entrepreneur in a business. So the, the lawyer, you know, and, and how the firm is structured is one thing, but I think that understanding entrepreneurship and being flexible with respect to risk, I think is a challenge for a lot of lawyers as well. And so finding someone who really can get that, um, get over some of that risk and help to understand where you need to go and what are the options to get there and let you take that those options and decide what's best for you and then backfill all the risk if you need to, right? Because <laughs> I have clients who they'll sign anything. Like I will <laughs> sign anything because I want that business. Okay, well, you need to know what it says <laughs> and then we can backfill all the risk. Um, and then we have the ones who won't sign anything without complete review and complete discussion and we can't get them to move forward. So that, that you know, differentiation matters. I think, so I just had a, a realization when it came to working with lawyers is because I, I get, it's a lot like working with your CPA. Like I used to talk to my CPA the same way that I would talk to my accountant or my controller. And it was a whole of a relationship. Like it just, they don't like, they don't, they CPAs look at it from a very specific perspective and there is no, there's no flux or anything. You can't have the same conversation with them as you would an accountant. And that's what now, now when you said that, I'm thinking, well, yeah. So you go talk to a lawyer and you're, you're a high, you're the business, you're the business guy and you're, you're willing to take risks and you're dealing with a lawyer that like, you don't want to say it because it's almost embarrassing because you know what they're thinking is like, you're <laughs> wrong. They think you're driving a, you're driving a car off a cliff. When that's not even what's happening, but you just have two, you have two people that look at things completely differently and you, you got to have, you got to, what I've found is for myself is I got to have somebody that 
helps control those relationships. And when you're talking to that person, you understand this is not the person to be talking to about how high risk something might be, or should I do this with the money or do that? What makes the most sense? Like certain people look at it from an entirely different perspective. And that makes sense now. As I look back on some of my conversations that I've had with lawyers throughout the years, yeah, and I, I think that, you know, if if you mentioned something about embarrassing, which I think is actually a really insightful comment, is this sort of ivory tower thing that, that kind of people experience going into certain conversations. And it's not just lawyers, there's other, other professionals as well. But if folks would sit down and say, here's the thing, I'm going to sign this no matter what. What I need for you to do is to tell me what it says, what my risks are, and how I backfill that, Right. And that confidence to be able to say that that's what I need from you and knowing that that's what you need from them. That's a, like, those are two things that are really difficult to overcome because you don't necessarily know what you don't know. That's why you're hiring them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so overcoming those barriers and being able to, to have a relationship with someone to say, you know, you know, you know how I think about the world, you know, what my risk tolerance is help me get this thing done. And I think that's a really important piece of this is the lawyer's job to help you get this done. And perfect is not what we're going for in many cases. In most cases, I would say we're going for like, here's what we need to understand. Here's how we need to get how we need to move forward. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that business owners don't do that they should around risk mitigation, you know, business continuity and disaster recovery. Um, because yes, you're going to sign it no matter what, then we're going to try to backfill these things, but there's some things we're not going to be able to, right? This business is not necessarily going to be able to tick and tie every single thing. So can we live with that risk? And if we've already signed it and we don't know if we can live with that risk, that's that's a gap, right? So how do we, how do we recognize and fill that gap? Do we have the plans in place for um, succession planning, for business continuity, for disaster recovery? And no one wants to do any of that work because it's a painful, painful exercise exercise but it's valuable when you know something completely unexpected happens do we have you know the tools and the systems and the processes to say all right guys everybody take your posts you know like muster stations on the on the you know ships right it's like do you know where to go do you know what to do do you know where to find your life best <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, we need to know that as a business right mm -hmm. well no I, and I think a lot of times like if we do it being honest, I, I'm guilty of this. And I know guys listening, the girls listening out there are as well is where you just end up signing stuff because you don't understand it and you don't want somebody to know you don't understand it. Like we're as, as business owners in the, not just being risk takers, but we want to be out there and we're looked at as we should just understand everything. What I've realized is, is being a business owner, you understand a very small percentage of everything and you need to have the right people around you for everything else because otherwise you just, and we can't have this facade that we understand everything. Cause that's, especially with what we're talking about here, that's where you start to get in trouble. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're big proponents of the same thing. You know, we're not tax people. So bring in that CPA, you know, do you have the banker who can advise on, on these things as well? I think um, it, it's hard also because it can get expensive and complicated fast. Right. So as business owners, the other thing that we want to do is we want to get it done. Like I need it done tomorrow because I want that business um, or I want that employer. I want whatever. And I don't have time for you to like go around these contracts and spend all this time doing all this redlining. And like, can we just, get it done. Right. And, you know, be, and all it takes is one experience that's like that, where I lost, I, I nearly lost this because they didn't respond, the lawyer didn't respond or whether it was the CPA who didn't respond or whatever it is. And they're never going to call again because I can't take that risk of losing my business um, or that business opportunity or, or even responding to that business um, issue or problem. So the, the, again, going back to the, the business centric um, advisors. And I've, I've seen this with CPAs as well. You know, the ones who are very much like, I'll do your taxes once a year, just send me the documents and I'll file the thing um, versus the folks who are strategic and they want to talk to you quarterly about what's your you know cash flow statement look like and how do you think about um, the next three years of profitability? Like, they're different, you know, versions and mindsets. 
Um, same thing with lawyers, right? Finding someone who knows that moving at the speed of business matters. Um, it's not like, oh, well, sorry, you know, I got three things ahead of you. Um, I'll get that to you in three weeks. <laughs> like it, it, it's not going to fly. And so as a business owner, I take a very similar approach because I'm like, if it were me and it's my contract that I need turned around, um, I think a week is a long time, right? <laughs> so like moving along people. Um, yeah, that, but I think there, there's a balance there in preparation that I think matters, right? Like the idea that as business owners, we have to also not expect our advisors to turn things around in 24 hours because they have other people to work with. So how can we help them to be responsive by being as proactive as we can be to say, hey, this thing's coming down the pike. I expect to get it next week. You know, what's your turnaround time? Um, and helping them to be responsive. That you're leading the conversation exactly with what I, my, my next comment was going to be or question was going to be around, like, we wait to bring, like, if you know stuff's happening, don't be waiting till the last minute to reach out to the person when you need some turnaround on something. And I think that can be one of the the biggest headaches of it all. And when we talk about cost perspectives and it gets crazy, if you're not proactive, we, we've spent the last three episodes now talking about pro, just being proactive with what you do. And legal counselor is no different. You can be proactive with it. You can build that relationship. And when you know these contracts are coming in or there's government changes or you're do, redoing your hiring process, uh, maybe not like wait until you wrote it all out and you need it in the next 36 hours to reach out to the lawyer on Friday afternoon. I mean. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not uncommon, um, but it does take it does take some training because, again, the idea is, you know, spend the least amount of time you possibly can on this. So I'm hoping it'll take you only two hours. Right. Well, but, you know, you want it to be done right. And that's I think that's the real benefit. And, and one of the things that I think, um, again, the industry doesn't really enable for most for most businesses but think about the amount of time that you're spending as the owner your team is spending in hunting down like the rules around some new regulation or reviewing contracts and trying to kind of you know parse out what these things are saying um you know the value of your team's time compared with the use of any of these advisors um that time can be spent by your team members doing something more you know proactive and productive that's their best use um hr is a great example of you know the number of of you know times where you know office managers business managers hr people depending on kind of what what level folks have in their business are you know on the internet trying to figure out like what are the implications of this new wage law or what are the implications of this new you know regulation or permitting you know requirement and if you had the confidence to hand it off and give them the freedom to do their things, then you would say, hey, I know it's gonna be done. I know it's gonna be done timely. Um, yeah, I'm gonna pay a little bit for that, but at least it's right. And I think there is a balance there of, you know, right person, right seat, um, and kind of understanding the cost of, of um, the opportunity cost that person is losing by doing this work instead. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that balancing is also something worth just sort of having in the back of your mind when you're trying to decide, is it worth it? Like it's one of my, my kind of catchphrases on this, is it worth it to call the lawyer? Um, and that's the, the balance that people are always, always working is like, is it worth it this time to spend that money? Um, and part of the, the opportunity, I think, and again, not all lawyers are, are open to this, but how do you build a you know financial relationship with a lawyer that works for you and makes sense for you and your business and there is a shift toward more fixed price um, solutions more flat fees um, but if we could take away this fear and anxiety of how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take and really have transparent rules for engagement um, it would really i think give people the freedom and the confidence to call awesome i love it i love what you're doing I love the conversation we just had. So for all the construction champions out there, if they wanted to reach out to you, connect with you, follow you, or learn more about what you do, what's, what's the best places for them to do that? Yeah, of course. We're, we're really active on LinkedIn. So it's um, Equinox Business Law Group. Um, so we do, um, we have a 
subscription to the newsletter via LinkedIn. We have um, pretty active posts on new new changes to the law, as well as just generally how do you think about working with with uh, legal counsel. Um, you can also reach out to me, I'm Michelle Bomberger on LinkedIn or um, via email, Michelle at Equinox Business Law. And um, our website has a ton of information. We have a business health assessment that is complimentary. It takes about five minutes to fill out. You get a report that really sort of just gauges, you know, how are you doing in different parts of your business based on your responses? We do have the people who want to get the right answers. And so they kind of choose the right answers. But if you choose the true answer, you're going to get a better response, I promise. Um, but we found that to be a really great sort of tool to say, yeah, I'm feeling really good about these things. And what the heck is data privacy or what the heck is this compliance thing? So it's a great like planning tool and a way to kind of prioritize some things. So feel free to take that. Um, it'll come to your inbox after you fill out the survey. Um, and that's at um, equinox.law or equinoxbusinesslaw.com. Awesome. Well, yeah, if you don't fill out the survey right, like <laughs> <laughs> when shit hits the fan and you don't fill the survey out right, like don't come complaining to anybody else. I guess. <laughs> Michelle, it's been great having you on the show. Thank you for taking the time to be on the show today. Ron, thanks. Great to meet you. Awesome. All right, construction champions. Another amazing episode. And what I want to, like, here's the, I don't even really have to think of the, the go ask yourself in the mirror question, because it's really, it presented itself is what are your gaps? Are you backfilling this stuff? Where are you vulnerable from a legal perspective? Because I, we all know, like, you probably don't even have to go to the mirror because it's probably the thing that's been in the back of your head that you've been worrying about for the last 30 days because you're like, if this happens or if John does this, or what if this contract goes south? What if, What's my repercussions on that? This is all stuff you can get answers to. And here's the amazing thing is if you're proactive about it, just like we keep talking about on here, like this might just become the proactive champion, construction champion podcast, because... What we find out is the more proactive you are about stuff, the better the outcome at the end. So you can clean up the mess that you already have going on and then learn to be proactive. I highly recommend going, taking the, taking the survey, the, not the survey. What was it again, Michelle? I forget. The business health assessment. Go take the business health assessment. Don't lie. Don't cheat. <laughs> it's just like a test in school. If you lie on it, or you cheat and you get a better grade, that does not mean you're going to be better off because of that. So be honest, actually take stride in what you learn in that and reach out to Michelle if, there, if there's gaps. I know there's going to be. And yeah, I, I, I just, I love this conversation. I mean, how many times have you guys been able to just sit in and tune in and for 30 minutes, just get something like, have have some legal counsel right here. Answer, just talk, shoot, shoot straight from the hips on this and tell us what it's like. So construction champions, go take the business assessment. Like just do it. Be honest about it. Make sure you go check out all of our great sponsors that keep the show rocking and rolling. And until next time, be the champion you were meant to be. Hey, construction champions, it's your host, Ron Nussbaum here, and I want to talk to you about how you can automate all of your marketing. We've had so many people on here talk about getting the systems in place. Well, we have partnered with Build 12 and Construction Champions podcast, Les O'Hara, the founder. What really excites me is his 30 years in the industry. And now he's built a system to be able to nurture your leads and continue to utilize that. I personally use the system myself. Build 12 is absolutely amazing. There's a lot of value in there. And it's a way to start getting away from Angie's list and all of that kind of stuff and start actually creating your own leads every day and have a system for them. So go on our website Check out the show notes. Go check out Build 12 and what it can do for the front end of your business today. It's absolutely amazing. I highly recommend going and meeting with Les and his son, Devin, and talking to him about what they built for their own business. 
so the rest of the industry can take benefit from that. Here on Construction Champions, we're all about helping each other out. And what is better than contractors helping contractors? I say nothing. So let's go take this to the next level. Go check out Build 12. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or Les or his son, Devin. We're here to help. We want to continue to grow the industry.